When learning a new language, what's more important, grammar or vocabulary? Well, first I would like to say is that it's really hard to understand any sentence or uh, any, uh, anything that's being said in another language if you don't understand the syntax that's used, even if you know all the vocabulary. Because in some languages like um, Spanish, French, Italian, and English, there's a lot of vocabulary that's shared uh, between the languages, so you might get an idea of what's being said without having studied that language very much. Um, but you may not be able to actually uh, communicate in that language, and so even without grammar, uh, you would be able to understand things. So I would say that the first part is that if you understand vocabulary, that's going to come before grammar. So even if you understand the vocabulary, does not under does not mean that you're going to understand the whole sentence. The whole sentence is really syntax. And syntax is different than grammar. Grammar is more like declensions and conjugations of verbs, and you know where, uh, what words are, are are changing other words in the sentence, and how adjectives agree with the uh, with the um, you know the, the the nouns that they're describing. And so grammar is kind of a, a really loose concept. And so I don't really talk about grammar all that much because there are like very specific things about it. Um, when you're learning a language. Uh, one of the most important skills is that you're able to hear the sounds correctly and you're able to produce the sound. So that's phonology and understanding how the tongue position uh, in your mouth will help you pronounce things better. The second thing will be vocabulary. So without uh, a massive amount of vocabulary, you can even learn how to speak a language with a small number of words, maybe uh, 500 to 1,000 words. You can, you can speak a language uh, fairly fairly uh, okay if you um, have a good grasp of the syntax and how words go into the sentence. So for example, in a language like Japanese, you know that you're going to be saying um, certain things in a certain order and your verb's going to come last. Uh, and in German, sometimes you, ha you have like a helping verb at the beginning of the sentence and then your main verb's going to go last. And so you have to learn how to manipulate words and, and place them around the sentence. And in languages like in the Slavic languages, uh, for example, Czech, Polish, Russian, um, when you want to talk about things that, uh, that have been completed, you're going to be using a lot more prefixes on your verbs. And then which prefix to use is sort of a grammatical thing, but if you're practicing these in full sentences, you get a feel for how those uh, prefixes work. So you'll get a, an idea of how odd versus s, meaning to come out of, or come away from uh, works, and it, it's, it, it, can, it can actually, once you learn that skill, it actually applies across most of the Slavic languages in the same way. Um, it's just, you know, what are the main differences between the languages is probably just some very slight uh, changes in pronunciation, structure of the, of the vocabulary. So I would say that the, the most important skill that you can have is vocabulary, and then if you have the ability to actually analyze vocabulary, like you can look at a word and see its history. Um, for example, if you know that the WH words in English, like who, what, when, where, why, and even words like while, uh, these words, if, if you know that they came from a very ancient Indo-European sound, kwa, and then you find that that k becomes like a ch in some languages, it becomes a k in some other languages, it becomes a v in some other languages, you can actually acquire vocabulary quite quickly. Um, and so, for example, if you're, if you're learning like a Slavic language, I remember at one point, you know, I learned the word chwile uh, in Polish, and it means a while, it means like for a, a period of time, you know, and so it's like, oh, while, chwile. It's like pronouncing while, with all of the vowels, uh, you know, hubi um, le. So you can sometimes find some connections between languages, between words that seem on the surface completely different, but they probably do share a common history. And so that can actually help you acquire vocabulary faster. Um, understanding how the, the P's become fuzz um, from like, uh, from the Latin languages to Germanic languages. Um, there's particular rules in the history of vocabulary that can tell us, like Grimm's Law, uh, how these uh, sound changes happen across these different groups of languages. So one thing that's interesting is that if you take a word like, um, like you know, I was just mentioning this this hua sound, the hua in what, while, although we don't normally pronounce the h in English, um, you get like a v sound in in German, but in 
in most of the, the Romance languages, they're going to be k sounds. And so you can actually find, uh, because this is a, a condition of, the, of, the, of human language in general, how sounds change over time in a natural way, you can actually find parallels in other language families. For example, um, many of you know that I'm a near-native speaker of Chinese and I live in a Chinese-speaking environment. And so even in the Chinese world, in the Sinitic world of languages, for example, the differences between Cantonese and Mandarin, you'll also find words like hua, which means flower, and uh, that's going to be pronounced uh, ka if the, the, for the sound that's borrowed into Japanese, and then, um, which is separate than their own word, which is hana. But it, you also find that word in Cantonese, which would be pronounced with a fa. So you, you have this hua and then a fa, uh, you know, that difference between Cantonese and Mandarin. Kind of similar to how you have between the Romance languages and Germanic languages. Another example is the word kwai in Mandarin, which is fai in Cantonese. So when you learn these sound changes between uh, languages, you're also able to uh, pick up vocabulary at a much faster pace. And with uh, more understanding of the vocabulary, when you hear things um, in context, when you hear new vocabulary in context, you're able to understand those sentences much faster, you're able to pick up on that vocabulary and turn it around into something that you're able to use directly, right away, in your conversation. And so that's one of the most powerful skills that polyglots will have. I remember Richard Simcott was telling me a story how uh, he, would, uh, he would sometimes share uh, little stories of things that he's learned from uh, some of the South Slavic languages like Croatian, Slovene, uh, Serbian and Macedonian and he says you know a simple a simple word in Macedonian if you just change like one vowel sound or one consonant sound you get the equivalent in Croatian, Serbian and Slovene and sometimes people who don't have any knowledge about languages even the the native Serbian or Macedonian speakers will just be like their mind is blown they're like wait where do you see that I don't understand how you got to that conclusion it sounds completely alien to me you know, that same word in just across the border sounds completely alien to a native speaker. But the polyglot, on the other hand, actually hears the same word with slightly two different pronunciations. So you kind of have to think about language learning in a sort of a meta state. You have to step away from it and say, hey, there's um, these sound changes happen over a vast area and they, and they kind of get dispersed into different languages. And if I want to focus on just improving my French or Italian or one of these languages, you just focus on what are the sound changes in there and you're able to pick it up very quickly. You know, one very simple example with um, French is that, and you'll find the same thing happens in Italian. If a, if a word starts with a st or a sp, well, normally the Italians, they can't use the regular article. Uh, they can't use, um, they have to change it to a lo or li. You know, they have to put a vowel in between there. And then so that, that vowel uh, carries over into other languages like Spanish and French. And so in Spanish, you have that additional E at the beginning of the word. So in instead of saying, saying study or student, you say estudi, estudi. And in French, that S has disappeared. So it becomes étude, étudiant. And so you have that specific sound change. And when you step back and think about it in a meta way, and you can see the big picture, you can see how these sound changes are happening. And then you can carry those ideas over to other language families, like for example in East Asia, or in, um, in Africa, in uh, North and South America, you can look at other language families and see how these same sound changes are happening over time. And so we can actually uh, find out how old words are. For example, if um, words are in one language are pronounced k, and in another language they're pronounced ch, then we know that that ch is probably the, the newer word because it, it changed over time into uh, it became a softer sound over time. It's probably unlikely that it went from a ch to a k over time. So we would say that the k language is, is probably the source um, vocabulary for that other language. And there's like hundreds of these little sound rules that if you know them quite well, you're able to kind of produce the whole other dialect or language and even um, track this language where it's going. Uh, into the future and how this language is going to sound in the future or maybe how that language sounds in a neighboring country as a different language and so phonology itself is a very fascinating thing but you need to tie phonology in with your vocabulary so that you can acquire vocabulary really quick you're able to see the word and catch on to it and learn it very quickly